Welcome to the StoryCraft Cafe. Come in, grab a cup of your favorite beverage, and get ready to join the storytelling conversation. StoryCraft Cafe is brought to you by Dabble, the ultimate cloud-based fiction writing software. Here we're going to bring together storytellers from all walks to encourage and empower you to craft your best story. Welcome to the StoryCraft Cafe. Did you know that we have a social media site just for writers? You can find it at storycraft.cafe. You can meet other story crafters that share the same hopes, dreams, struggles, and victories as you do. Join in the daily writing challenges, see when a new author interview is coming up, and join in the conversation and fun. Again, that's storycraft.cafe. Be sure to subscribe in your favorite podcast app and leave us a review if you don't mind. It helps others find us. Also, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'll drop a link in the show notes so you can find it easily. You can join me live as I conduct these author interviews, and you too can join in the conversation live as it happens. Today's guest, Josh Winning, is a horror writer that writes mashups of horror and suspense, and we have a fantastic conversation about why we resonate with these kinds of stories, what it means to want to curl up with a good book that kind of scares you at your core, and how you can get these feelings across to the reader. It's a great conversation, and I'm so glad you joined us for it today. Now on to our show. Storycraft Cafe. I am your host, Hank Garner, and today I'm really excited to have Josh Winning on the show with me. He's got a fantastic new book that was released yesterday. If you're listening to this live with us, if you're listening to the podcast later in the week, it was this previous Tuesday. You know, a little time travel on the fly there. Um, but the new book is called Burn the Negative, and this is such a um, a fun book, and I, I hesitate to say fun um, because it's a uh, it's a very tense book, but uh, but crafted in a very fun and exciting way. We're going to talk all about it. You'll know exactly what I'm talking about uh, in just a minute. But Josh, welcome to the show. Thank you. Hi, it's great to be here. It's it's great to have you, um, Josh. I like to start each show with a fun question to uh to kind of get things going and uh one thing that i love to ask people is what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller i started writing when i was quite young and um it it was mostly taking stories that i already loved so i grew up reading things like the narnia books by c.s lewis and sure. all the roald dahl stories and what I used to do was I would either tell a story that was inspired by those books or I would rewrite those books to change them more to my liking. <laughs> so I would sort of take, so I took The Magician's Nephew and I rewrote it to get rid of all the so-called boring stuff at the start of the book because um, <laughs> I just wanted them to be a Narnia immediately. Right. So that's kind of my earliest memory, I think. Wow. That. So how old were you when... Um... When, oh, I mean, when you were doing that eight, seven, eight. Wow, wow. So, um, from that point on, did you did you know that that you would be a writer, and was that your your sole pursuit? Yeah, it was just always the thing that I wanted to do. You know, if I had a spare moment, I would just think about stories. I would start writing. It's just I was always doing it. Um. And I, there was never really sort of like a decision or, you know, I, when I was a kid, I wanted to be an Olympic gymnast. That was my dream when I was about eight years old. As um, one does. <laughs> yeah, I know. Just I was doing <laughs> gymnastics at the time. It wasn't just completely uh, fabricated. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think quite quickly after I realized that was an incredibly difficult thing to do, I realized just how much I love writing and dreamed of having a book on a shelf and and sort of like telling my own stories to sit alongside all the authors that I loved. All right. Um, you have a, a love and a fascination with um, 
the uh, the macabre, the the creepier side um, of of stories. Where, where do you think that fascination comes from? The only thing I can think is that it comes from those amazingly creative and creepy eighties fantasy films that a lot of us grew up with. Um, yeah. Yeah, like Labyrinth, The Neverending Story, The Dark Crystal. Those were films essentially aimed at families, at children. Right. But they had such a, a fascinating thread of darkness running through all of them. And they didn't sort of speak down to you as a child. They they really have such interesting philosophical ideas and themes. They're not just throwaway entertainment. And they didn't shy away from the darkness. And I think that that is the reason that I became interested in sort of the more horror oriented stories. The, those were such fantastic films. And and you're absolutely right. They were um, marketed toward families, uh, toward younger viewers, but but they really were intense stories. And I, I feel like we we've lost a bit of that. Like um I don't know if we're if we're just scared um of these more mature themes for younger people or I'm not sure exactly where that got lost, but um it was a really interesting time and a really interesting um group of pieces of entertainment that are kind of lost to to that time yeah it's definitely something that i've thought about a lot over the past few years and mourning the fact that nobody is really making films like that anymore we've got you know we've had the resurgence of um star wars um right. and obviously we had sort of reboots for the dark crystal and willow the the warwick davis film from the 80s as well but there's clearly an interest in those properties but i think that because a lot of it i do think a lot of it is to do with money i think that these are expensive things to make and i think hollywood has become even more risk averse than it's ever been before it's a very tough climate out there so i think that if you came along and said i want to make a film about creepy sort of vulture like birds who live in this very unusual living world and they eat podlings you know people would be like <laughs> yeah and no, i think i think we're just going to make another star wars actually you know it's, right it's a bit safer <laughs> right um, your your first novel was a bit of an homage to to that time. Is it is that right? Yeah, the Shadow Glass. I mean, the title is a reference to the Dark Crystal, um, and it was definitely me wanting more of that kind of film and and thinking, well, if I want more of that kind of film, surely there are other people out there who want it too. So that's how I created the Shadow Glass in order to sort of take people back hopefully to that feeling that they had when they first watched labyrinth and never ending story and sort of put an adult spin on it maybe you know yeah. it's 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 for the people who love those films but are my age you know mid 30s now and want more too there's uh, yeah nostalgia is a strong um uh, feeling and it uh, we're, we're all nostalgic for something um, I, I think you and I would probably share nostalgia for for these types of films and these stories um, other people are nostalgic for for other types of things and 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 I know that people want to tap into that so so you wanted to kind of relive this feeling again and and to have a story that that kind of honored that tradition. But then how do you go from having this feeling of nostalgia and wanting to relive this type of story to coming up with something new and, and something that is uniquely your own? Yeah, that's a really good question. I kind of, I knew that there were certain things that I wanted the story to have. So I knew that it clearly had to have puppets. It had to have a fantasy world that was, sort of like interesting and different and philosophically uh, rich. But I did want to tell my own story. I, I couldn't have just done, I couldn't have attempted to replicate anything that Jim Henson or Wolfgang Peterson did because um, I'm not them. I couldn't have done that. What they did was right. brilliant. So my way in was 
actually through the character of um, the main character of Jack, whose father directed a film called The Shadow Glass in the 80s, which was a puppet fantasy adventure, and it flopped. And it destroyed the relationship between the father and son. And um, so, you know, the, there had to be a reason for the, the puppets and the, the characters to um, have a story to be told, you know. And, and so Jack was the reason. Once I found Jack, that was um, my own fresh thing that I was bringing to the story. I wasn't just rehashing previous material. Yeah. Do you, do you consider yourself uh, to be a planner or or a pantser? Um, how do you approach story craft? Do you do you know the the story kind of it, its intricacies or, or at least a roadmap of it before you begin the drafting? Uh, I'm a tortured sort of mixture of both. <laughs> I, <would say. laughs> I, I think most people kind of fall somewhere between those two. Yeah, I do. I really try. I try so hard to pl to plan, and um, often I'm I'm able to sort of plan halfway, and then I start to lose my way a bit. I think that the the magic really is in the writing for me, and I I feel my way through a story as much as I um, sort of you know try to plan stuff out. Like I'll, I'll maybe have set things that I know I'd like to happen. But the actual discovery of the story does happen in, in the moment for me. Gotcha. Um, also, um, along with your novel writing, you also are a journalist in the entertainment space. Um, wh what got you interested in, and what got you plugged into to, uh, doing this kind of work? I'd kind of already been doing a very juvenile version of it you know early 2000s I, I was running movie websites and I was writing movie reviews and um, you know reading magazines like Total Film and just loving the process of examining a film and looking at its positives and negatives and trying to figure out why it worked or why it didn't work for some reason I just really enjoyed doing that but I never really put it together. I never thought I could actually be an entertainment journalist because I didn't really know that they existed. Um, and I was very much wanting to, to write books. So when I went to my lecturer when I'd graduated university and said to her, I want to be an author, she kind of very kindly or very brusquely said to me <laughs> that that's an incredibly difficult career path. Have you thought about journalism instead? And I hadn't. But she she set me on this path. She, you know, told me about this film, uh, this magazine journalism course that I could do, and that was basically a, a gateway into into journalism. Wow, I've uh, I've gotten to meet a number of journalists turned novelists um, <laughs> through the years, and I'm I'm thinking. I don't know that that I have uh, met any entertainment journalist per se, um, but I'm always fascinated with the the toolkit that you uh, acquire and develop as a journalist and how that translates to novel writing. Um, you know that just the the tools that you pick up and the the way that you learn to um, uh, to perceive. A, a situation and by reporting on it, you know, that the way that feeds the the creative mind, um, if you will. Um, how do you feel like that these two different sides, uh, one, you're, you, you're a journalist, therefore you're, you're writing nonfiction, even though it may be about fiction um, versus your fiction writing where you are, the god of this universe and and you hold all the power how do, how do you yeah. kind of juggle those two sides well i never felt that more than when i so both of my books have sort of um a multimedia aspect so they 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 both contain articles reviews script snippets and um i thought writing a lot of those would be really straightforward and easy but then I realized that it's a lot easier to write a feature about a film when you've interviewed somebody and they've given you all the good stuff that you need to say. So sure. sitting down to write a fake film article about a fake film, 
populated by quotes from a fake person that I came up with <laughs> was actually quite difficult because when you're a journalist, you're trying, you're working with what you've got. But as a right. fiction writer, you've probably got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> at least in or everything scenario. You know, well, yeah. You look at it. yeah well yeah exactly I, I kind of had to switch something in my brain that said you can make this up now and normally it's like don't make this up you're going to get into right. legal trouble if you do <laughs> whereas this time i was like ah i can just make it up okay i love it um wh what things have you learned uh about hollywood uh that that maybe people would be surprised uh to find out Oh, wow. Um, it's kind of obvious, but there really are so many people involved in a film that you never see. Right. There are just so many people. There's a job for everything. Well, um, I, I think anyone that stayed to the end of the movie and watched all yeah. those credits scroll by, you're like, who are all these people and wh where are they during this whole process? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's... um. It's quite something to see it when you, if you go onto a movie set and you see all these people um, working on on the same thing that the big Hollywood stars are, and you think, geez, yeah, this is like a, a huge operation. No wonder it takes such um, drive to actually get a film made. You know, you you assume that to get a film made, you just get a script, get a director, get a cast, get a location, off you go. But it's it's a huge undertaking. Yeah, I think, yeah, I'd say that's one of the biggest things. Yeah. Your your new book, Burn the Negative, um, was that inspired by anything that you have witnessed or, or been involved with? Uh, was Is there a, a real life inspiration behind this book? Yeah, there's, it's, it's a real um, hodgepodge of, of a lot of different experiences that I've had. Um, in the movie set is a big thing. But the, the sort of gem of the idea was when I met Lorraine Warren, who is the paranormal investigator. She's, she was very famous for investigating the Amityville horror. She, um, she's played by Vera Farmiga in the Conjuring films. She spent her life investigating so-called hauntings and ghosts and possessions. And I met her because I was reporting on the Conjuring 2. So I went to her house and... Um, you know, had a chat with her. We all went out for dinner afterwards. She took me down into the occult museum that was below her house. And I just always thought I would really love to write about a psychic one day. I don't know if I believe in them, but I found it really fascinating that she truly believed. She really did believe. Um, so that was the starting point. And it, it only really sort of congealed into anything when I thought, what if there was a psychic who's actually sort of a skeptic? And they're not like any of the psychics you've seen in these movies. You know, they're not like Zelda Rubenstein who comes along to try to save everybody. The psychic in Burn the Negative couldn't care less and frankly doesn't want to be there. Doesn't believe in cursed movies. So that, that for me was like, aha, okay, I think maybe this is something. Mm, in Anyone that has an occult museum in their house, uh, I think you have to sit up and 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 take notice and and... And th that's someone that you want to pick their brain a little bit. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, she she saw the museum as sort of like a bit of an air locker where she's sort of keeping all of this negative energy just trapped here and making it mm -hmm. safe. And I think, you know, there would be a priest who came in to bless all the artifacts. Um, so she saw it not so much as sort of like an amusement uh, park, but an actual you know, a bit like in uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know, somewhere to actually keep all of this bad juju. Yeah. What what kind of feeling did you get when you went down? And was there anything in there that, that uh, you know, uh, tickled your uh, borderline <laughs> skeptic brain? No, no, it was all, um, it really was a bit of a circus of horrors down there. It was <laughs> lots of um, very innocuous looking things that were dressed up with like spooky red lighting and stuff and, um it was kind of sweet i thought actually <laughs> <laughs> um we've we've heard um urban legends and things over the years about movie sets that are haunted or um you know weird things happen um uh, you know i can think of 
uh, some horror movies in the seventies and eighties that, you know, have, have these, these legends that build up around them. And then it gets to the point where you're not sure if that was true or not, or maybe a little thing happened and it snowballed through the decades. Um, are there any, any real stories that you're aware of, of movie scenes that have gone horribly bad or movie sets? And, uh, you know, is there any truth to some of these things that we've heard? There's there are, yeah, as you said, there are a lot of stories. A lot of them are sort of around that moment in Hollywood where there was sort of like occult focused horror films. So like the Omen yeah. and the Exorcist and, um, yeah, so there are stories about people who died involved in the production, you know, really quite tragic, awful things that happened to people. Uh, and that is interesting because, you know, terrible things happen all the time on movie sets. You know, accidents happen. They happen on all kinds of films, action films, um, comedies, but it's the horror films that get branded with this curse right. sort of stamp. And... I just wonder why, and that's kind of a bit why I went down the cursed movie route with this book, because I think there's sort of like, there's a tragedy to what happened to these people, uh, but then it doesn't prevent people being really sort of morbidly curious about the reality of it all. Yeah. When prepping to write this book, did you research some of those um, movie sets that, you know, have these legends around them, and, and what did you find out? Yeah, I skimmed. I did skim through a few of them. I, I mean, a lot of them had already been handed down to me through, you know, the urban legend movie machine. So yeah. I, I was aware of a lot of them already. Um, you know, things like The Wizard of Oz. There's stories about The Wizard of Oz with the the problem with the paint that was put on the Tin Man and how it was actually suffocating the actor. And there's mm. rumors that you can see a munchkin um hanging in the background of one scene you know it's really really grisly stuff um and you know it's all i think that it's part of the movie magic i think hollywood is so great at telling stories and it's it's part of the experience you know watching a, a horror film you want to be scared and then this sort of cursed movie idea allows the horror to sort of transfer into real life and keep that experience going for the for the viewer it's yeah it's a funny phenomenon yeah there's a a theme or subtext to this book um about the the price of fame and what what are you willing to to trade or to pay for this exalted status um i'm always really fascinated by themes and um and whether the idea of a theme is present in the beginning or in the writing or, and I've heard from so many people that, that say when, when the book is finished, when they finish that first draft and they're looking back over it, these themes emerge and, and they weren't even really aware of it, but you know, these things just kind of work themselves out in the writing. Um, were, were themes uh, on your mind in this or, you know, was it like so many other people say? Yeah, I think, I don't know if this counts as a theme, but I definitely always have a single word that I keep in my mind when I'm when I'm working on a particular book. So with Burn the Negative, the word was truth, which is like, it's a very generic kind of word, but it yeah. actually informed Laura, the main character, massively because she is a journalist, you know, it's her job to find out the truth, to report the truth. And yet she is sort of at the center of this supposed movie curse, which could or could or could not be true. And so that was a, a fun thing to flip around with across her arc, to be like, okay, well, at the moment she is telling other people's truth so that nobody cares about hers. Um, and as the book goes on, she starts her relationship with the truth changes. So for me, I think it is more of a word that I, I sort of try to hang things on. Yeah. When you're, when you're writing horror or suspense, um, uh, there, there's an interesting um, 
play with emotions uh, that happens for, for the reader, especially um, because if it's just a, a gruesome fest from beginning to end, um, the reader will grow weary and, um, and there's, there's very little emotional range. Um, and that, that's one of the, the, uh, the key pieces that a writer gets to play with is manipulating the reader's emotions that's up and down um, so that the, the ups are, are more impactful and the downs are more impactful because, you know, you're, you're taking them on, on a journey. And, and this book is, is no different. Um, the, you inject moments of levity uh, into the book uh, with, with great skill. Um, and are those things that you think about when you're, when you're writing the book, you know, that, um, the the creepy can't just happen on every page. You know the you need to to kind of dole them out a little bit so that the reader <laughs> is anticipating and and almost in that anticipation, um, you know, works themselves up without you having to do anything. It's you know, <laughs> setting the stage and then letting their own imagination and emotions sort of run wild. And and I've always admired that about horror writers, suspense writers, is the ability to to pace um that story were were those things that you were thinking about when you're writing this and and how yeah. exactly the the reader is going to react to this part of the journey yeah definitely yeah i i kind of i think that you have to earn those those big horror moments and you're right if you if you keep punching something it's gonna fall apart eventually so yeah. yeah, I'm definitely aware of that the the rhythm, I guess, of the story. You know, you 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 have those peaks, and then you have the quieter recovery. Sort of, re, re, uh, what's the word? Sort of like the recovery moment, um, right. where you regroup, and that's the moment where you can be funny, maybe. And um, characters, I th I just think people are generally funny. You know, people the way they talk, the way they think is is quite sure. funny. Um, and I grew up sort of devouring shows like Friends, um, and Spin City, Caroline in the City, like Frasier, all of these great American sitcoms that showed in the UK on like a Friday and a Saturday night. And so I think in my head, dialogue often is that kind of snappy sitcom style. Um, which maybe is something that comes out not I'm not saying that I am anywhere near as funny as those writers, <laughs> but that general feeling or that style definitely I think comes through from those those shows that I grew up on. Yeah. Um your your main character uh, of Laura, um do you do you see a lot of yourself in that character and were you were you writing um yourself into the story in a way? I kind of think that she's maybe like a more extreme version of me. Um, her her snappiness and her intolerance of anything <laughs> sort of you know mildly irritating is definitely me, but but multiplied. Um, the fact that she sort of says things that then she regrets or sort of upset people that that's something that I feel I do. I don't know if I actually do do that in real life, but I, I often think that I put my foot in my mouth and it's something that really frustrates me about myself. So it was great to put that into Laura instead and, and see maybe a more extreme version of that. Yeah. If, um, if this book gets made into a movie, which would be the most meta thing um, that I've seen in a while, um, who do you <laughs> think could be, uh, who do you think would be a good fit to to bring this to the to the silver screen? Oh, in terms of directors, yeah, the directors and 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 who do you think um, would uh, their style would fit this? I I know that John Carpenter doesn't really make many films nowadays, but I feel like he would be quite an interesting um, choice. Not only because I love John Carpenter and would love to meet him. But he has that grittiness. He has that slight tongue-in-cheek thing. He knows the genre inside and out. His style is is just sort of like slick, but not overly so. Um, 
So I could, yeah, I could definitely see John Carpenter doing this. <laughs> if he called me up, I'd say, all right, John, <laughs> why not? <laughs> that would be amazing. Um, when when a reader gets to the end of the story and, and closes that back cover and they're, they've gone on this journey with you, what do you hope readers are left with? I hope they're a little bit scared. I hope they're sort of unsettled by what has happened. I hope they sort of understand Laura in a funny kind of way. Um, and I just kind of hope that they found that felt themselves being sort of dragged along on this wild Hollywood horror show. Love it. Burn the Negative is available everywhere now. Uh, go visit your local bookstore, support local books, and pick up your copy. If you don't have a great local bookstore uh, near you, we'll put links uh, to Amazon in the show notes where you can grab it from there. Um, is is this available uh, as an audiobook, Josh? I, I didn't um, look when, before we started. It is. Yeah. Uh, um, have you listened yeah, to any Stephanie of it? Yeah, Stephanie Cannon is the narrator, and she's done such... Yeah, she's done such a great job. I'm nice. so, so happy. Her, her Needleman voice is terrifying, um, <laughs> and she captures the characters really, really well. I, she's just done such a great job. I love it. We'll put links uh, to the Audible uh, as well. Um, Josh, if people are just discovering you and want to follow along with all the great stuff that you're up to, where's a good place where they can connect with you online and follow along? I'm on Twitter at Josh Winning. Um, I'm on Instagram at Joshua Winning. And if you want to go old school, I do have a website, and that is joshuawinning.com. Excellent. We'll link those up as well. Uh, Josh, I love the book and uh, can't wait for everyone to grab their copy of Burn Thank the you. Negative. And uh, please come back and join us again sometime. I would love to. Thank you so much for having me. All right. That's our episode for today. There's so much more to come as we talk with authors about the craft of writing, but also the business of publishing. Be sure to subscribe to the StoryCraft Cafe podcast in your favorite podcast app to never miss an episode. The StoryCraft Cafe is made possible by Dabble. Writing a book is challenging. Your writing tool shouldn't be. Dabble is an easy-to-use online writing tool packed with helpful features that allow beginning novelists and published authors to create amazing stories. Visit us at dabblewriter.com and start your free trial. Thanks for listening.